Good afternoon, everybody. Ah, right, here we go. So, my turn on the roller coaster. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this event. This has been absolutely phenomenally organized, and it's a pleasure to be involved in it. Um, I want to say up front that I am not an expert in the technology that I'm about to be talking about, nor do I have any particular investment in it. This is just something, um, something I've become very interested in recently and something I'm going to try and deliver to you a very concise view of it over the next few minutes, and I'll be as quick as I can. So, the power of blockchain in promoting fair trade in music. Okay, so what is fair trade? For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to refer to the World Fair Trade Organization's definition. So, a trading partnership based on dialogue, transparency, and respect. So, the first fair trade coffee produced in Mexico hit the shelves of the Netherlands in 1988. Through partnership, through dialogue, transparency, and respect, small-scale coffee farmers could now produce coffee and earn a fair living despite the effects of unpredictable weather conditions or economic turmoil. This initiative was a huge success, and today coffee makers in 30 countries across the world are now the first part of a transparent chain that ends with us, the consumer. And why does the public choose to drink fair trade coffee? Because they are presented with a choice. And because people will generally do the right thing. It's embedded in our own school's culture of kindness. So, what does this have to do with music? I'm a musician. This is my CV, or some of it. Um, and like millions of other musicians, I have a very varied skill set. So I don't just play the saxophone. I've spent years developing a range of skills that not only fulfill my desire to be, to cre uh, to be creative, but also make me employable. I've been fortunate to play stadium concerts, tour with international artists, um, play on award-winning songs, and write or program music for TV and radio. And I'm very proud of my achievements as a musician. I can't tell you how much fun I've had doing it. Different percentages are paid for physical sales, downloads, and streaming. So it's a total disaster for a musician. And it's incredibly complicated for an artist to track what they should be earning, forget when they should be receiving it. So this is absolutely not a transparent system. In fact, it can get much more opaque than this. So, it's the lack of transparency in the way and the speed at which sales revenue is distributed that has led many musicians to move away from record labels and become independent artists. This became possible in the new, new digital era, but it can be very long, complicated, and expensive po process as well, especially when there's a back catalogue involved. This can have a lot of downsides, but the driving force to do it, there was a lack of transparency, and they didn't trust the system. Into the long and complicated line of people that collect money before it reaches the artists come the streaming audio services. They now take an additional slice of the pie, and those crumbs just got a little bit smaller. There's our distribution model originally. Thank you. This is the royalties concept, and this is how musicians are feeling. So, Eddie Schwartz, head of the Songwriters Association of Canada, is quoted as saying, in the latter part of the 20th century, if a song that he had written sold one million copies, he could expect to receive a mechanical royalties payment of 45,000 US dollars. Today, if a major streaming service plays his song one million times at 0.00, 0035 US dollars per play, he can expect to earn $35 from those million streams. Again, some artists have responded by pulling their music from streaming services and launching their own. But this is absolutely fantastic if you're Jay-Z and you can afford to, but I certainly can't. So, we're at a turning point in music. Artists, publishers, and record labels have lost control of the music that they're releasing. So, how can the industry as a whole, respond to this change. The industry as a whole need to agree on a way forward. We need to agree on a way which consumers can purchase and use music responsibly that ensures a fair payment to each of the services in the chain, including the person at the very start, the artist. And one idea is to use the technology behind bitcoins to solve the problem. I'm at the climax now. 
So what is the Bitcoin, and what does this have to do with music? Bitcoin began as an open source project. It's a digital currency or cryptocurrency where an underlying ledger holds information and each copy is held on multiple computers around the world. Once a transaction takes place, the information is registered in what's known the blockchain. Once a block is full, it is added to the blockchain in chronological order and the information stored within it cannot be altered. This is a transparent, trustless system no single person, organization, or entity can manipulate the data, and it's safe. Following the global financial crash in 2008, more and more people turned to digital currencies as trust had been lost in the traditional financial structures. And the problem with music is at the point of creation, the product, the song, is saved as a WAV file or AIF file or MP3. The information stored in that file can be altered at any point. Any one of you could do that now just using your laptop. So what if the music industry responded to change and began releasing music using this new technology? What if there was a new standard audio file type owned by the recording industry in which information can be embedded at the point of creation? This could include ownership information, ISRC. That's how we currently track if somebody's playing a piece of music on the radio publishing details, mechanical rights, usage rights. Are you allowed to use the music for what you intend to use it for? Payment, inf payment information there. Performer information. You could know something about the artist again. In fact, you could embed any information that you wanted. So, how can block te uh, blockchain technology work for musicians? A new format of music could exist on a central database and be accessed by everyone, not held by labels, recording companies around the world where there's no central database. This could go out to one central digital database and it could be accessed by everybody here. A smart contract, as it's known, could be embedded into the blockchain and the master. And every single play could be stored in the blockchain, including how many times, by who, and where. All the information could be shared with the rights holders instantly. Game developers or TV producers will be able to know instantly whether or not they can use content and connect directly with the rights holders there and then. Payments could be triggered automatically and directly to the rights holders of that music. In fact, devices could engage with the smart contract and either accept or reject the music based on the terms of the smart contract. For example, keeping count of the number of times a song has been played and preventing it from exceeding an agreed number of plays before triggering another payment. The possibilities are endless. If everyone was on board, devices could be coded to reject music without a smart contract. And that would be an interesting twist to piracy. So a transparent system would emerge I could log onto the database and see where my song is being played, as it's being played, and I could personally thank that person for listening to it. We could, we could change the way in which an artist interacts with their audience far beyond you, the liner notes of 99. This is where my plagiarism comes in, so I'm going to own up now. A lot of this research has been undertaken by the British singer, artist, and producer as well, Imogen Heath, and it's to her I owe a lot of this, a lot of this information. I also have her permission to use it as well. Um, in fact, an artist could include all sorts of information. If you'd like to know more about it, I strongly suggest you go and visit the Mycelia project, which is Imogen's current project. And her intention is to reestablish the connection with the audience in ways far beyond these liner notes, as I discussed. There's nothing to stop that catalogs from being converted into the new format and added to the database in the same ways that iTunes did with Fairplay. This just requires buy-in from the record labels. There are steps that need to be taken at each level of the process, and companies will emerge to take care of this as well. We're not trying to cut out the middleman at any point. Just reimagine the future. This global modernization of the music industry will create jobs and return some of the control to the artist and the rights holders. So, the future. Finally, people will have the choice to support the fair trade of music or ignore it. And generally, 
given the choice, people will do the right thing. And in the same way that streaming services have become the norm recently, in the same way that CDs were the norm back in 99, so too can this. As it stands, there is so much potential for incredible music that will never be heard. Is blockchain technology the future for an industry which has rejected change for so long? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Perhaps there's a different way to regain control and re-establish a relationship between artists and their fans. But since we're living in the innovation capital of the world, let's start putting our minds to what that might be. Either way, as consumers, we need to look to the future and agree to embrace fair trade over the alternative. Please keep this in mind the next time you're walking through the mall, or out for lunch, watching TV, listening to the radio, or streaming from Spotify. Do you value music enough to make the right choice? And if not, imagine a world without it. Thank you very much indeed.